It's six o'clock on the dot. Yeah. It's six o'clock on the dot. How about that? I'm live. It's six o'clock on the dot. How's everybody doing? Let's see if I can get rid of that so I can see me. Okay. Hey, there I am. Hey, six o'clock, Bob Dickerson in the black. Wednesday evening, Wednesday, December 9th, 2020. So, so boy, and I, I didn't think about this today. Uh, today uh, is the day that, the date, the day of the month that my mother and father got married. They got married December 9th, 1950. December 9th, 1950, 70 years ago. And uh, of course, my dad passed away in 2015. So they didn't make that seven. They, they were almost 65 years uh, when he when he passed. But uh, 70 years ago, they got married. I used to love to hear him tell the story that uh, they didn't have any money. So they got married and then he had to get a scuttle of coal. Now I have no idea what a scuttle of coal is, but he had to get a scuttle of coal so that they could keep warm. So anyway, uh, happy December 9th, two days after Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, Pearl Harbor Day, you know, we all know Pearl Harbor Day is one of those days that, uh, what did Franklin Roosevelt said, it will live in infamy and it, it certainly has. Uh, the day uh, Japan uh, attacked Pearl Harbor and got the USA into World War II. Uh, and that was 1941. Uh, Sean Thurman, Tamika, Sharon, how you doing today? Good to see all of you. Good to see all of you. Hey, a lot of stuff happening. I want to start off and I, wanna, I gotta talk about football. Uh, Roll Tide, you know I'm a Tide fan. Everybody knows that. If you know me, you know I'm a Tide fan. I'm a Tuskegee fan. I'm a Tide fan. Um, I'm a Cleveland Browns fan. The Browns, man, the Browns are nine and three, <laughs> playoff bound. Man, uh, you know they beat the Titans. You know, and I, I, you know, I actually pull for Tiffany. How you doing, Anthony? How you doing? I, I actually pull for Derrick Henry. You know, I like to see him do well. But, hey, I'm a Browns fan. The Browns, my brother texts me. The Browns, he's got this bone, you know, the, the dog pound. So, uh, anyway, the Browns are doing well. Um, uh, hey, great to see them. It's been a while. I mean, it has been a long time. Now, I'm old enough to remember when the Browns were one of the dominant teams uh, in the National Football League. I remember. I don't quite remember Otto Graham. I've seen the clips of him and when they hit the white football, you don't remember that. No, you don't remember that. They had a white football back in the all American football league. The Browns were dominant. They came to the NFL in the late forties, early fifties. They were dominant. Um, the Browns had black players from nobody else. They had a guy named Marion Motley. Mary Motley was a fullback uh, with the Browns back in the early fifties. Go check it out. Otto Graham was a quarterback. And then they got Jim Brown. Uh, I actually watched, the movie the the express so when i'm on a treadmill i'll watch movies and um and so when i'm on the treadmill i'll watch movies and so uh <laughs> anyway while i'm while i'm on and i'm watching movies let's move that back around while i'm on and i'm watching movies uh you know i can stay on longer because i get absorbed with the movie some people listen to music i do that too so i watch the express that's the story about Ernie Davis. Ernie Davis won the Heisman. He was the first black to win the Heisman Trophy in 1960 or 61. And he actually got drafted by the Browns. Never got to play because he was diagnosed with leukemia. And he passed away, actually, at 23 years old. But he followed Jim Brown to Syracuse. So anyway, the Browns. Bama's doing well. Roll Tide. But here's the thing that I just got to say this about. Football, here's what I don't like. The Big Ten to try to get Ohio State in the playoffs has changed the rules. <laughs> I mean, they said, okay, well, we can't, you know, we'll just change the rules. My mother said I used to do that when I was losing as a kid. If I was here playing a game and somebody was beating me, I'd try to change the rules. Well, the Big Ten changed the rules 
to say that you can be their conference champion without having played six games, I think it was. So I, w- I want to know what's fair about uh, Ohio State could make it to the college football playoffs because the playoff committee, they like Ohio State. They are. They're a great program. Nothing against them. But they shouldn't they shouldn't get in over, you know, Texas A&M if Texas A&M doesn't lose another game, which they probably won't. Um, Florida's prop Florida's going to play Alabama in the SEC championship game. If Florida were to win, I don't think they will have a forbid, but if they win, then you got to put both Bama and Florida in, uh, Notre Dame. If they beat Clemson, you got to put them in If Clemson beats them, but I just don't see why and how you would put a, Four and zero potential, well maybe five and zero if they win the championship game. A five and zero Ohio State in the playoffs over a ten and one Texas A and M. Five and zero, ten and one, SEC versus Big Ten. And I mean, I know COVID is not their fault, but I don't think it's right. I'm, I'm just saying, I don't think it's right. So anyway, on the you looked at Twitter on the political front. Hey man, this stuff really doesn't go away. Hey, I was I, I read an article today. It kind of talked about Melania and she is she is ready to get out of Dodge. She does not want to stay in DC. She's trying to figure out how to pack up the stuff and how to get to Mar a Lago, you know, and resume her life. And could you blame her? I mean, I certainly don't blame her. Uh, but 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 she's ready to go. But did you did you see where? 17 states, 17 states in the United States have asked the Supreme Court to overturn, (coughs) excuse me, to overturn the election in the swing states, Uh, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Arizona, and I'm not sure where else. So states are asking the court to invalidate an election that already happened and people already voted and we're supposed to be living in a democracy. Now, how does that happen? How do we call ourselves a democracy and why aren't people in Congress, why aren't everybody up in arms about this? And how in the world can somebody in politics and government and leadership want to cheat so bad and want to win so bad when you actually lost and want to overturn the will of the people so bad that you would stoop, and I do mean stoop, to any low position in order to do that. That is ridiculous. The fact that Donald Trump is able to continue to say without any rebuttal from people in his party that the election was stole, that I really won, that I'm going to get another term, is is ridiculous for him to be able to say it in a democracy. But not only is he saying it, other people are not refuting it. Powerful people who have a say in what happens in this country are not refuting it. And when you don't refute a lie, when you don't refute something that is taking you in the wrong direction, when you don't correct something that's false, then you obviously are going along with it. I think CNN reported yesterday that out of 200 and some odd uh, Republican people in Congress, that only 20 were willing to say that Joe Biden has won and will be the next president. That says that 250 Republican so-called elected officials, so-called senators and representatives, um, you know, so-called patriots are not willing to say out loud that Biden won and he won by 7 million votes. Uh, his electoral college win is bigger than Trump's was last time, which Trump called a landslide. And these folks are still sitting here. 
And so I see the signs that say stop the steal. And my concern is that the wrong folks got the signs. So Trump supporters are sitting here with these signs saying stop the steal. Hey, we might need to get us some stop the steal signs too. Because the shenanigans that these folks are pulling and pulling, what, trying to pull off, may pull off, talking about pulling off, it's ridiculous and it's scary. And it reminds me of some third world two-bit country that we said that we are not. This is not who I'm trying to get this done. This is not who we say we are in the United States of America, the good old USA a democracy that's for the people, by the people, of the people, where every vote is supposed to count. Where the will of the folks is the will of the people. You know, we elect folks, the will of the people. We've been electing presidents for 240, 39 or 40 or whatever I, I said, and I forget the number, but it's over 230 years, 240 years, we've been electing presidents. And there's always every four years there's been an election and every four years there's been a winner and a loser and never before. Even when we had the hanging chads, y'all remember the hanging chads, you know, you don't have to be that old to remember that because that was just 20 years ago. Abbott in Florida went to the Supreme Court. Al Gore conceded instead of continuing the fight, he conceded for the sake of the United States of America, he conceded. Donald J. Trump and his acolytes and his supporters and the other Republicans that are elected to serve people of this country are doing us a disservice. We are, I could imagine what folks in you know, in Great Britain, in Germany, and other allies, countries that are allied with us are saying. But I also can imagine what they're saying in North Korea <laughs> and what they're saying in China and what they're saying in Russia. And even in some of the countries that we quote unquote call third world, that we expect this kind of behavior out of leaders, coups and 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 takeovers and and, and, and corruption in government, man, is this where we're going? Ron Hall, is this where we're going? Hey, not where we're going, is this where we are in this country? Every time I turn on the news and I see that 17 states tell the Supreme Court to support the Texas Attorney General's bid to reverse Biden's win, we're going to now, you call it a win and you say you want to reverse it. You won, but now we're going to take it. So I'm telling you, the wrong folks got to stop the steal signs. I'm worried about the steal. I will be worried. I'll be worried until Monday when the Electoral College meets and votes. I'm going to be worried. I'll be worried until January 6th when Congress, I believe that's the date that Congress certifies uh, the, the the decision by the Electoral College. And I'm going to be worried up until January 20th when Biden stands there and takes the oath of office. And when Trump is moved, you know, they do it like, you know, over, you know, like in an hour. So I guess they must have some hell of a movers to come in and move your stuff out and move somebody else's stuff in and like right now while he's taking the oath. So yeah, and then I, I think I said Melania's ready to get out of there. She's trying to get to Florida. I don't blame her. You know, I really don't blame her. She's she's making inquiries, though, as to whether there are, are pensions for the first ladies. And, and it's not, and they really, there, there aren't any. As far as I can tell, it's like 20 grand a year if the man dies. Uh, he does have an expense account. He can still travel. I think he still has some Secret Service uh, protection and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, it's kind of crazy, man. COVID, COVID. Oh, oh, did you see this? The, the Michigan State Representative Cynthia Johnson, what the folks said to her. I mean, this was just insane. Uh, they called her the N word. They threatened her life. I mean, you can't make this stuff up.
<laughs> they, they called her the N-word. They threatened her life. Because she asked Rudy Giuliani a, a good question. I mean, come on. Rudy needed to be asked that question. I mean, Rudy is not, uh, well, I don't know what to say about Rudy. I'm just not feeling Rudy. Uh, let me see if I can get this back on. You know, I hate it when stuff times out. I guess I got to figure out how to make it not time out so quick. But Rudy has COVID. And did you hear him when he said that he sometimes he wears a mask and sometimes masks, you know, he kind of bought that Trump line. Oh, uh, well, masks, sometimes they don't help. Sometimes they hurt. And but he but he was able to go to a hospital when some people are just give us some medicine and sent home. We know plenty of folks that have had it and did that. And he's kind of just playing loose and fast. And, you know, he and Trump and a lot of other Republicans are taking this real cavalier attitude about a disease, you know, that's killing folks. I mean, 300,000 folks going up, probably going to be a half million. Thank God there's a there's vaccine on the horizon. But it'll be a year before we're kind of comfortable. I saw a report say, well, maybe by 4th of July, you know, folks that want to celebrate the 4th of July, I'll, I don't celebrate it. I'm going to celebrate Juneteenth, but not the 4th, 4th of July. But maybe around that time, we'll be able to be in close proximity with our family and friends and not have to worry about dying. Okay? Not to worry about that. So anyway. More people are dying. So look, if you're planning a Christmas gathering, please rethink it. You know, stuff that you've done every year out of habit and out of tradition. Maybe this is the year that you break with tradition. You know, I, I just think that tradition is less important than your life and your health. And so let's 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 break with tradition. I mean, the other thing that uh and this was this was big news last couple of weeks i should have mentioned it last week coming out of thanksgiving but we're, we are america is in a food crisis anthony we're in a food crisis um there there's always been hunger and po poverty and despair but this problem has been exacerbated by the economic shutdown and people losing their jobs and these are smart folks these are folks who were employed these are people who are middle class. You know, they're able to work. They've been contributors to society, not necessarily recipients. But now they've found themselves in these precarious positions and they're having to visit food banks. Now, can you imagine that? Having to visit, and thank God I haven't, and I hope you haven't as well. But there are people, but, but for the grace of God, you know, there go you or me. And so, you know, this is nothing to play with. We've got to get back on track. And we have to have leadership that helps us do that. And we've got jobless rates. Well, they aren't at historical highs. No, but they are, they are crippling our communities and crippling our people and crippling our families. Uh, folks have found themselves in predicaments that they, they've never experienced before. And your heart just has to go out to them because they got children. And, and, and these children really, even though, you know, the bigger kids might say, yeah, mama, I understand. But, but the little babies and little kids don't understand. You know, they don't understand having to have stuff ration. Uh, they don't understand having uh, to, to, to be hungry, to go to bed hungry, to, to not have the things that they are accustomed to. And we can do better. But the big trouble is that we've got these folks with their partisan ideas and ideals and their partisanship is preventing them from taking the kind of action that's helping. Thank God Congress is now about to pass, hopefully, uh, another version or another piece of the CARES Act. But we should have as, as we should have been done that. Is that right? Is that, that's probably not grammatically correct. But anyway, we should have been done that. Should have been done that. I like it. I like I like should say it should have been done that because we should have, you know, we should have. We should do everything that we can. To try to help people. 
uh, we should we should do everything that we can to try to help people. So I just wanted to say that. L listen, I want to I want to talk about one more thing, and and this is this is something that the coronavirus didn't create. Donald Trump didn't create it. But and it's something that I've talked about before, but it just fell on my heart. And I wanted to to share once again the fact that this the the the, the economic realities that are facing America's middle class are the middle class. And I don't mean people in poverty. I don't mean folks that's living at eighty percent of median income. I mean the middle class. So middle class. These are folks that have a car or two. They have a house, but they also got a car note. They got a mortgage. They got kids, they got college bills, or the kids got student loans, or the people got student loans. They go to work every day. American workers over the past half century have been the most productive ever. But this American dream, and the American dream, let's, it's economic prosperity, it's a career that lets you support your family. Uh, it's appreciation from your employer it's, uh, for your service and for your loyalty. It's, it's a chance to participate in the economic success that your the company you work for enjoys. Well, you know, that dream isn't as vivid as it was 50 years ago. Again, we've been our most productive over the past 50 years, over the past quarter century, past 25 years, we've created more billionaires than any period in our history. I mean, we have this, uh, this wealth, and wealth defined the abundance of possessions and money. But it's all being concentrated at the top. It's all being hoarded at the top of the economic ladder. And it's not being shared with working class and middle class Americans, regardless of their color. White folks need to be hearing this. Because you're getting screwed too. You're just voting for the folks that screw you most of the time if you're here in Alabama. The, the, the wealth is not being shared by the folks that are working for it. I, you know, we read about medieval times where there were serfs. Serfs were slaves. Basically, yep, your, your serf, you made sure they stayed alive and they stayed healthy. And, and, and we think about it, yeah. So if I can keep you with a car and a house and a mortgage, you know, so you got to go to work because you got a car note, you got a mortgage, you got to go to work because you got student loans, you got bills to pay, you got to go to work and you make me rich and I just give you enough to survive. I give you enough to survive. So, you know, like two years ago, I received this Economic Justice Award from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. I'm very proud of that. It was on the anniversary of the 50, 50th year uh, assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. It was actually on April 4th, uh, 2018. And, 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 and in my speech, you know, I mentioned that the fact that King, had, who had been focusing on uh, access and civil rights and access to public accommodations, Riding to riding the front of the bus, uh, voting rights, which we know are linked to economic justice, you know, inextricably. But he also was fighting for economic justice, for workers' rights, you know, for the right to fair wages, for a right to a decent job, for the right to be treated fairly when you went to work. And and I pointed to one of the scriptures that that King that King quoted in many of his speeches. Uh, it was Amos 524, but let justice roll down like a river and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. But, you know, if he were around today, a lot of folks like to say, well, what would, he, what would Martin Luther King, well, if he were around today, he would have to wonder, has the stream of prosperity, of upward mobility, of fair wages, of economic security, has that stream been dammed up? You know, is it a dam or somebody blocked it off? <laughs> hey, Katrina. How you doing? I mean, is the stream dammed up? Is the, is the stream running dry? That 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 ever flowing stream of justice and righteousness, economic justice and righteousness. So, I mean, just keep in mind, we live in a country where corporate CEOs earn 300 times that of their workforce. 
Now, I don't know about you, but it'd be hard for me to believe that if I'm a vice president and I'm making 150000 good, good sir, nice sir, but the CEO makes $15 million. Huh? Even, even, even me at a hundred fifty, which is a good salary. Most folks would love to make that. You know, most people don't. But I, but I, I just want to show that to you, just as an illustration. You making one fifty, and you got a mortgage and a car note, which you likely do. But your CEO makes fifteen million plus a stock option. There's something wrong with that. CEO makes 300 times that of their workforce. And I'm not talking about the average. That 150, that's not average. 300 times that $40,000 person, that $30,000 person, that $60,000 person. Is that CEO that much more valuable than you are? I don't think so. So anyway, the middle class is beleaguered. One of the reasons that China has come up is because they've empowered their middle class. So when you empower and pay middle class folks, what happens, they spend more money. They spend more money. And when they spend more money, the businesses do better. But when businesses do better, what we've got to do is we have got to make sure that we take care of people better than we're taking care of them now. We cannot go another 50 years and not give people a raise. And that is exactly what has happened. Kimberly, how you doing? Um, the American worker, when you think about his wages now compared to 50 years ago, 1970, 50 years ago, your money came by as much today, even though your salary may have quadrupled. So have the prices of everything else. So we've got to protect the middle class. Uh, middle class Americans, you know, need things. They, they need lifestyle and housing and child care and education and health care. They're not so concerned with interest rates, the stock market or the gross domestic product. So all these folks that say that we're doing great because the stock, the stock market is doing good pulling your leg and you may have some stock in your 401k yeah you you know we all do we all should have something tied to some economic indicators that's good and i'm not knocking that but the stock market gross domestic product you know whether the rates are two percent or three percent or six percent is not as important as us having good decent affordable housing that escalates in value uh of us being able to have world-class education for our children so that they can do better than us. And for us to be able to have health care, which ought to be the right of everybody born in the United States of America. Hey, American families are, 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 are having to focus on surviving in, in a country that has enough wealth that we ought to all be focused on thriving. We can and we must do better. This is Bob Dickerson within the Black. Check you out again next week.